for aiding Jewish youth in a school that he managed in Le Chambon sur Union. Likewise, for the Catholic cleric Father Jacques Lucien Brunel, who died in a German camp after his arrest for harboring several Jewish children in his religious school in Avon near Fontainebleau. Rescuers in France had to fear not only from the German overlords, but also from their own collaborating agencies, followed the pro German Vichy regime. The French milice was notorious for brutalizing persons suspected of aiding Jews on the run, such as Pauline Godefroy, who was arrested and tortured by the police after being implicated in aid to Jews. She had been working for the Jewish inspired Georges Garel network that assisted Jews on the run. And she's on the list of the righteous. There were four principal types of aid for which the Al Hashem sponsored righteous title may be awarded to rescuers of Jews. These are sheltering, dissimulating, moving, and help the children. Let's mention each of them. Sheltering. This means helping a fleeing Jew disappear from public view, to all intents and purposes, by sheltering the fugitive person in a place where no one in his right mind would suspect that a living soul was in hiding there. This also means to feed and care for the fleeing person, even at times for the removal of bodily waste. The other form, assimilating, this means trying to pass as someone else, as a non-Jew. For this, one needed legitimate credentials, a false identity card, a false birth certificate, a proper address and place of work, and persons who would speak up for the dissimulating Jew in case of questioning. Moving. Another form of help was assisting Jews to flee from an endangered place to another location, either within the occupied regions or across frontiers to countries out of reach of the Germans. And not embroiled in the war, such as Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, and Turkey. In France, for instance, conditions were risky for Jews in the Vichy region, but less so than in the occupied zone of the country. Such as in the case of Raoul Laporterie, mayor of Basson in the Lamp uh, Departement, who helped Jews flee from the occupied zone to the so-called free zone, the Vichy zone, during the early period of the occupation when Jews felt safer there, and he too is on the list. Some diplomats also facilitated the flight of many Jews out of the German hands. The world is well acquainted with the heroic activity of the Swedish diplomat, Raoul Wallenberg, who acted in Hungary to save thousands of Jews. Also worth mentioning in this regard are Aristides de Souza Mendes, the Portuguese Consul General in Bordeaux, France, who issued thousands of Portuguese transit visas to Jewish refugees in the city on the eve of its surrender to the Germans. Also, Jan Zwartendijk and Senpo Sugihara, the Dutch and Japanese consuls in Kolnas, Kovno, Lithuania, who likewise issued transit visas to thousands of Jews stranded in that country. Finally, the fourth and final category pertains to the rescue of children. <laughs> Persons involved in that endeavor included those who traveled long distances to make the proper arrangements, escorted the children to their new home, and made the routine inspection visits to make sure the children were well, well cared. Not to overlook the host families themselves, who took the frightened children into their homes and showered them with affection, love, and patience. In France, in particular, thousands of Jewish children survived by being hosted in non-Jewish homes or in religious and secular children institutions. To date, some 23,200 persons from all European countries have been awarded the righteous title, including slightly over 3,000 from France. This, however, should in all fairness be considered only a representative sample of the real number of rescuers who largely remain unaccounted. For if we add up the number of Jews saved in all countries under German domination, we safely arrive at a figure of well over 200,000. Hence the likelihood of an equal number of rescuers or people who aided them in one way or another. In France alone, close to three quarters of the initial 325,000 children survived. In other words, well over, well over 200,000. So the, the close to the 3,200 French names on the Yad Vashem's righteous list is therefore well below 
any realistic number of French persons who may have been engaged in the rescue of such a large number of Jews and who may subsequently qualify for the coveted righteous title. The reason then for the relatively small figure of rescuers listed at Yad Vashem may be attributed to several factors. One, not all authors of rescue operations are awarded the righteous title since they do not meet the earlier enumerated criteria for this title, such as first-hand testimonies by the principal beneficiaries of the rescuers' aid. Two, many of the rescuers and rescued died in the post-war period, hence their personal rescue narrative remains unknown, or only through second-hand and hearsay accounts that may by themselves not be sufficient for the attribution of the righteous title. Finally, and this may be perhaps the most important factor, many survivors find it excruciatingly painful and psychologically inhibiting from reliving the traumatic events associated with the Holocaust. They therefore prefer to postpone to a later date details of their earlier harrowing experience when they underwent the most dehumanizing ordeal imaginable and some may even decide to take the whole sordid tale together with their own rescue, which saved them, but not their immediate loved ones, to take it with them to their grave. Thus, it is best to view the 23,226 rescuers currently identified as righteous, not as a precise statistics of non-Jewish rescuers for each individual country, but as a representative figure of the nature and scope of help to Jews by non-Jews in the Holocaust, in which a much larger number of persons participated and who have not been accounted for. <coughs> Closely allied to the devotees of the righteous Gentiles are those of many Jewish rescuers who through their efforts and clandestine organizations exerted superhuman efforts and braved redoubled risk to themselves to make it possible for non-Jewish rescuers to partake in this humanitarian endeavor. Non-Jewish rescuers who were subsequently cited as righteous by Yad Vashem, while their Jewish counterparts were and still are largely overlooked. I remember sitting behind my desk at Yad Vashem, the father of the righteous, and receiving stories of rescue involving non-Jewish persons. Uh, while the rescue operation was initiated by Jewish rescuers, but I couldn't deal with that. It was for both. The story of these Jewish, that's at Yad Vashem, the story of these Jewish rescuers waits to be told, and their deeds properly acknowledged. For one can properly speak of rescue undertaken due to the Holocaust without mentioning the role of Jewish rescuers. At least the principal ones who acted above and beyond to save numerous of their brethren. The question then is why this significant facet of rescue operations has not been given proper exposure and rather been overlooked by the major Holocaust institutions. The standard response for dismissing the role of Jewish rescue is that a Jew helping a fellow Jew was merely doing what he was obligated to do there's nothing to brag about it. Whereas a Gentile helping a Jew, that was a behavior not expected of him, and this therefore merits special recognition. However, this rejoinder to a disturbing and challenging question is voiced to consciously or subconsciously avoid a deeper psychological reason. The answer to this perplexing question has much to do with ideology and myth creation, were linked with the rebirth of Jewish independence in its ancient homeland. Yad Vashem, an Israeli state, state institution, is not merely the first Holocaust institution to be created, but also serves as a guide and intellectual lighthouse for other later established Holocaust memorials. At the same time, Yad Vashem's position with regard to Jewish rescuers has also to be viewed within the larger context of the Zionist efforts before and during the formative period of Israel. 
that minimized, diluted, I went so far as to dismiss the significance of diaspora Jewry and Judaism through the 18th century's span of exile and never ending persecutions. The message was that to counter the centuries of persecution, diaspora Jewry adopted a passive and submissive course so as to weather the storms and survive and avoid any aggressive countermeasures so as not to further provoke the forces arrayed against him. This is best borne out following this argument in the record of Jewish behavior during the Holocaust, which was a display of confusion, helplessness, and submissiveness, and leaving the fate of the Jewish people in the hands of others. The sole exception to this hapless situation were the righteous Gentiles, who risked their lives to save one, several, or more Jews, and they con consequently merit the appreciation and thanks of the Jewish people. One additional exception to this state of near total paralysis, so goes this argument, where the few examples of Jewish vitality and vigor displayed during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and by the Jewish partisans. Then the full bloom of Jewish self-assertion came into fruition with the creation of the State of Israel. And the heroic record of confrontation against more numerous and powerful enemies bent on its destruction that lasted for many decades after the rise of Israel. The story of Jewish respite in the diaspora, persons and organizations who displayed not submissiveness and resignation to a bit of faith. This incidentally was mostly the response of major Jewish leaders, Zionists and otherwise. But initiative, inventiveness, and courage in a superhuman effort to outwit the enemy and succeeded in saving literally thousands of Jews. The record of these undertakings flies in the face of the near mythical depreciation of diaspora Jewry. When speaking of France, I have in mind persons of the caliber of Georges Gabel, Moussa Abadi, Joseph Bass, Rabbi Zalman Schmerzen, Robert Ganzon, André Salomon, Vivek Samuel, Denis Sikersky, Nicole Weiss Salon, and the list goes on, as well as the Jose organization, who raised risks to themselves to save fellow Jews from deportation and are credited with the saving of thousands of Jews. The record of these people seems to, to threaten the ideologically established myth of total Jewish helplessness in the diaspora when confronted with physical danger to themselves. Let us not forget that the Akashem, Israel's National Holocaust Memorial, was established by special parliamentary legislation in 1953, during the Maccabean period of Israel's history. It is therefore also a reflection of the ideological mindset that prevailed during the difficult period of Israel's rise and series of wars with neighboring Arab states. Legislators at that time felt no need to mention, let alone highlight, the unusual role of Jewish rescuers in attempting to stem the tide of the Nazi slaughter, in which they solicited the help of non-Jews, many of whom were hailed and celebrated by the state of Israel through Yad Vashem. And here I have to mention, when the discussion was in Israel in the 1950s on the creation of Yad Vashem, uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, the debate was on the date. When would be the date to commemorate uh, the Holocaust in Israel? And uh, the ghetto fighters uh, then insisted that it should be on the date when the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising broke out, which is on the day of Passover, the eve of Passover, uh, which is the 14th and the 15th of Nisan. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the rabbinic opposed that because uh, Pesach is the, the day of is a celebration of the deliverance, and and the uh, month of the sun, according to Halakha, is uh, one should not celebrate. Uh, it's, a, it's a month of joy and happiness. Uh, and so uh, finally, after much given back, it was decided to inject the Yom Hashoah between Pesach. Pesach is Geula. Uh, after Pesach is over, a week after that, Yom HaShoah, the 27th of Nisan, 
which is a descent into hell uh, catastrophe. And then a week after that comes Israeli Day of Independence, Tukuma. So you have this, this thing which then fits in uh, with the mentality. Another thing that is not known when Yad Vashem, the discussion of the, the, uh, the creation of Yad Vashem, uh, Mordechai Shemhavi also wished to include uh, the term of Gvura, and he wished to include uh, in the Yad Vashem, in the, in the museum of Yad Vashem, also the name of uh, the over one million Jewish soldiers that fought in the various armies, and the Soviet army, the American army, the Free French army, the British army, to show that Jews fought back. But uh, because of the legalistic thing, the legal problem involved in this, and appropriating soldiers from other countries, uh, this was dropped. Uh, the title uh, of the day of Yom HaShoah, which was proposed, was Yom HaShoah Umeret HaGetaot, uh, the Holocaust and the rebellions in the ghettos. Well, we know there was rebellion only in one ghetto, not in many ghettos. And finally, if you know the title of Yad Vashem, the Yad Vashem, Shut HaZikaron, La Shoah, La Yuvura. In other words, Holocaust, martyrs, heroes, heroes. Remember, so that and with heroes, they mean people who took guns and fought back at the Germans. So rescue was not uh, on the agenda. But the tide is now turning. A psychological and mental realignment that has brought many in Israel to have a second look at what some brave individual and organizational diaspora Jews did to save their brethren. This changing public opinion is only beginning to penetrate the walls of Yad Vashem that has until recently strenuously and somewhat aggressively fought to stem this rising tide and restrain the attempt to change its long established work agenda. Organizations, let us not forget, do not like to be told by outsiders how to manage their business. <laughs> when challenged, the response is uh, often resentment coupled with efforts to delegitimize those perceived as trying to meddle in their affairs, whatever the merits of the ideas proposed. This is part of organization mentality. Of late, they are fine that Yad is slowly and laboriously changing its policy in this regard and is exploring new avenues to grant an honorable place to Jewish rescue of Jews. We can only encourage it to proceed on that course with Yad Vashem taking the lead, other Holocaust institutions will follow its example and assign Jewish rescuers a proper and dignified place within its programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that that will inspire many questions. So please, a um, whole lot of those questions um, for our question and answer period. We'll hear from two other speakers. First, from Sarah Gensberger. And um, Sarah is a researcher at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique at the University of Paris East at Nanterre and the École Normale Supérieure de Cachan. She earned her PhD in sociology from the École des Études en Sciences Sociales and turned her prize winning dissertation into a book called Les Justes de France, Politique Publique de la Mémoire. Uh, which we hope will be translated into, into English. So again, if there are any questions in the audience, uh, please come forward. Uh, Sarah has also contributed a number of articles to scholarly journals and chapters to edited books, including two that have been translated into English. One is Nazi labor camps in Paris, and the second is resisting genocides. And Sarah is going to speak to us uh, about From Jerusalem to Paris, Defining the Righteous of France. So I want also to start with everyone for the invitation. Yeah, I do. So that's fine. <laughs>
show you the French case. Uh, if today around 3,200 3, uh, French writers have been officially recognized, in the mid 80s, there were on, still only uh, less than 400, um, which was very different from other countries such as Poland or Netherlands, for example, and even Belgium. Um, in the French case, indeed, and again, on the contrary to other countries, the request addressed to Yad Vashem has only been increasing since the French state representatives have been um, interested in the commemoration of the Rajas um, and began to participate in this commemoration, originally only um, dealt with by the, the Israeli state. Indeed, if in Israel the title of writers among the nations have been awarded since 1963, foreign governments did not show any interest in this commemoration until the 1990s. Since then, however, a growing number of European and even extra-European governments have been picking up on the term to celebrate their citizens who were Jews during the Second World War. In this process, I sh may say that the French appropriation of the Israeli title may have been the most fulfilled. Okay. Uh, the French government has indeed been forging a new national commemorative expression, Le Juste de France, and on January 18, 2007, President Jacques Chirac finally honored this right of France in an official ceremony at the Pantheon. So this is um, the piece the, you were talking about by Anna Serda, for those who uh, I did not uh, any chance to, to, to see it. So um, maybe we can discuss your point. I, I not totally agree, but the, the, the point was to, to show, um, to mix writers people from the war, and a lot of them were women. So some, the, most of the black and white pictures are some of the writers, and anonymous people from today's France, without any name. We, we can come back to this if you want. Um, so in these 20 minutes, which are short, uh, I will explore the way the French, this French lexical appropriation has been taking place and try to address the shift in meaning of the commemorations which went with this appropriation and pay attention to the role played by former Jewish rescuers in the process. So first, um, I will address briefly because uh, Mr. Fadiel has just spoke a little bit about it, to the original um, Israeli title of Righteous Among the Nations, um, trying to only um, deal with the point that this commemoration was at the beginning a diplomatic and uh, foreign relations uh, commemoration. So um, the expression of Righteous Among the Nations comes from the Hebrew Asideo Mata who in the Talmudic tradition stands for the Gentile, the Gentiles who abide by the divine commandments, and which time um, began to, to mean the friends of Jews in an overall non jewish society sought to be hostile to Jews as a whole. So this um, etymological meaning was at the core of the presence of the commemoration of the righteous among the nations within the Mordechai Shenavis project, which has been uh, referred to, as soon as uh, 1942. And um, this hoped for commemoration of the writers um, was expected to benefit the foreign relations of the future state of Israel. And, um, but the Yad Vashem was only created as you no, in 1953, and uh, one of his mission was to, to commemorate this, those righteous Gentiles who risk their, risk their lives to save Jews. Um, but this mission has not been fulfilled during the 10 first years of Yad Vashem, and it is only with the national trial um, taking place that, um, that Yad Vashem mm -hmm. effectively and actually commemorated the righteous among the nations. And again, the first um, commemoration of these writers within the Ashland trial was um, in a um, foreign relation perspective. Uh, it was first to, to treat the new uh, German relation 
with Israel uh, tactfully, and Ben Gurion deliberately asked um, Gideon Rosner, who was the prosecutor of the state during the trial, to refer to the righteous among the nations um, as example of possible positive links between the Israel state and the foreign states, mostly uh, the United States and the Western Europe states. And for example, it is stri striking to see to what extent in exposing arguments, the prosecutor for the state paid particular attention not to neglect any mentioning of any of the countries where the slightest of store of Jews existed. And there, the righteous among the nations were not referred to by their individual names, but through their collective national identity. But by the beginning, so if the righteous among the nations were referred to during all of the Asian trial, um, by the beginning of the trial, the government and Yad Vashem had not planned to create any permanent means of commemoration. It was not only a punctual uh, use of the evocation of the righteous within the Asian trial context. On this matter, the trial um, stimulated a great deal of initiatives coming from out outside of Yad Vashem and of Israel. Um, I can give examples later if you want, but the main one was the World Jewish Congress uh, initiative. Uh, the Congress wished to implement a World Council for Asidea Motarlam, and this concurring uh, project led Yad Vashem to finally establish a writings, Writers Among the Nations Department in February 1962. Uh, first, it was decided that the choice of the writers who were to be commemorated will be an administrative and state choice, I mean without any formal procedure, and that the, um, the recognition as a writers will go with the plantation of a tree, which is in Israel a national icon. And again, uh, in all this process, the, um, the perspective was a diplomatic one. The Ministry for Foreign Affairs represented the state uh, in, in Yad Vashem for the choice of the writers. Uh, but um, as you may know, the Oscar Schindler's case, which was meant to be included within the 12 first trees who were supposed to be uh, planted um, in 62, was actually discussed by former European Jews who lived in Germany during the war and led to the creation of a formal procedure, no more only administrative and state, uh, uh, state one, but uh, with the establishment of a commission, which still exists, and which uh, Mr. Fazia talked about, and this one was made jointly by the lawyers and judges and by uh, survivors and resistance fighters. Um, so, um, between 1942 and 1963 in Israel, the title of Writers Among the Nations um, took shape as an institutional category, both gradually and sporadically. The title of Writers Among the Nations was meant to qualify a minority group of individuals and to serve as a diplomatic way to better the relation between Israel and foreign countries. The gap with the contemporary meaning given to the term in the French context is very striking. Since in France today, um, the reference to the righteous among the nations are meant to foster a republican uh, spirit um, and to help to the coexistence of Jews and non-Jews and of all the different uh, groups within the French state. <coughs> so this is the planting of ceremony with uh, God and you, um, representing the state. This is an example of the drama in the middle. Okay. Um, so in, or in order to understand this shift in the meaning given to the commemoration, um, mm -hmm. I would try to retrace the process through which the very expression was translated into French, and by translated I mean both literally and metaphorically. Who in France did speak first of these new heroes and with which words and why? So, during its first meeting in February 1963, and in coherence with its criminal court inspiration, the Commission 
the Yabashan Commission enacted the rule that the title would only be awarded at the request of at least two Jews considering they were rescued and on the basis of their testimonials. In other words, and that was what interested me in my PhD work, um, to become effective, the, institu the Israeli institutional framework for the commemoration of the righteous among the nation had, and still has, to be filled by memories expressed by individuals. Well, until the end of the 1980s, <coughs> this framework had been barely filled as far as the French writers were concerned. So this is um, data you see there. By 1985, uh, almost 1,600 Polish and 2,600 two, 2, Dutch people, but only 3,064 French people had been awarded the title of the writers among the nations. Mm. And moreover, except some very rare local and intimate ceremonies in synagogues, no public events were in France ever dedicated to the commemoration of the writers. The Israeli term was never referred to it to in the French press or the national political sphere. The medals and diplomas to which new writers were entitled were almost only given to those who visit Israel and Bashan. And for those who stay in France, most of them were still uh, waiting in uh, the embassy uh, buildings at the middle of the 1980s. Uh, in other words, still by 1985, the commemoration of the righteous among the nations was both weak and limited to an Israeli space. It had, done, it had not yet been conveyed to France. The situation changed in the 80s. Um, for example, with the Chambon uh, memory, I was beginning to get public expression, as uh, Pierre Sauvage uh, works uh, referred to yesterday. But also in the decade, several former leaders of the Jewish Rescue Network published their autobiographies, and the associations uh, uh, of the Ancien de la Résistance Jews en France of, was officially created. Uh, in Yad Vashem, an auditorium dedicated to these veterans opened in 1982, and the formal Memorial de la Résistance Vive en France would from now on collect files under the names of each of the veterans. While regathering, or gathering would one say, this uh, led back to the debate we had with uh, Rene Koznanski uh, talk uh, um, before, uh, these former Jewish rescuers began asking for an official recognition of their heroism for both the Israeli and French governments. And in this process, some of them realized they had not paid tribute to some of the non-Jewish people who assisted them in their rescue mission. In 1982, Jacques Pulver, who was a former member of the Eclair Israelite Network, uh, and uh, Denis Sikersky, um, first addressed Yad Vashem as uh, witnesses, and realized, as what they called, I'm sorry, Mordechai, a casual way, um, Yad Vashem has been dealing with the French recognition of the righteous among the nations. Um, and they decided to mobilize them, themselves to change this. First, they wanted more, they wanted more, more files to be opened under French names, for French names. For, for this, they publicized, yeah, as, as they publicized the Yad Vashem um, procedure, and secondly, they, they tried to develop the ceremonies in France, asking uh, mayor and uh, local representatives to participate in this ceremony in order to give them the, a big echo. Um, and their, their initiative had uh, some effects. For example, they also w were the ones who wrote the questionnaire de Chambon, which some of you uh, may, uh, may uh, had to, to answer in order to have uh, the Chambon uh, recognized as a special place for rescue. And um, as you see, if you look at the number of new French writers each year, uh, after their mobilization, the number of um, new uh, very great change. And um, 
more broadly by asking the local representative to, to participate in the commemoration, this step-by-step -step kind of um, uh, created a combination between the, the Israeli state symbols and the French state symbols within the recognition of the righteous among the nation and the socialized part of the French elites to the French political elites to the existence of this commemoration. Um, I could come back in more details to this uh, in the discussion, but this is why, this is because of the action that uh, Jacques Chirac uh, sought of the existence of this term in the 1995 um, speech uh, René spoke about um, before. And because in 1989, he was host of a ceremony as mayor of Paris, they asked him to, to, to host the ceremony. So he was kind of socialized, socialized to the potenti to potentiality, symbolic potentialities of the commemoration of the righteous. So I won't come back to the 1995 uh, speech, which has already, already been referred to. But from this speech to 2007, um, um, a reciprocal legitimation has been taking place between the states and some of the French Jewish associations who, who began to, to invest themselves in the commemoration of the righteous because they felt kind of legitimized to do so by the presence of the state. And the presence of the state it itself uh, uh, was more and more legitimized to do so because of, of the implication of this association. Uh, finally, in July 2000, a law was passed with, with, which changed the name of the July 16th commemoration and um, uh, called it in honor of the victims of the racist and anti-Semite crimes of the French state and in honor of the writers of France. But for, before this final uh, text, originally the two MPs who promoted the law wanted to um, at the very, very beginning, actually, they wanted to give the resistance um, classic title, traditional title, French title, to the righteous among the nations. And they did not manage to do so because of negative reactions from the state. So after they wanted to create a French righteous among the nations title, different from Yad Vashem, but they couldn't do so because of the negative reactions of the Jewish associations. <laughs> <laughs> so it resulted in this um, new name for the commemoration uh, date, but I, I can come back to this also later. And uh, in a way, the Panthéon um, <coughs> ceremony um, was a way to, to overcome this obstacle and to really nationalize the, 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 this commemoration of the righteous and as righteous of France. about the use of the past, 
and mostly uh, from some means a positive role of the uh, colonization. Uh, no such discussion uh, took place in this case. And what I explain in my work is that the reason why it's because not for most of the Jews uh, rescued in France and who stayed to live in France, uh, this, uh, this investment of the French state within an Isra original Israeli commemoration kind of um, created an hybrid, an hybrid uh, commemoration which could be symbolically referred as to Israeli belongings, as to French ones, and which in a way uh, fit um, sometimes partly, sometimes totally with the actual um, Jewish identity in France. Um, and as a conclusion, I would say that from Jerusalem to Paris, from 1963 to 2007, the diffusion of the commemorative term of writers went with the diversification of its symbolic interpretation. While well, the shift in the meaning of the state commemoration implied, in a way, the multiplication of the meaning given to it by each individual. Thank you. legislation 
primarily because at the age of about 11, he decided he wanted to be a priest. He could not attend the local uh, school in Angers, a uh, seminary for priests, because um, there was such a demand for admission in the seminary, and he was still very young. Um, he wanted, uh, insisted that he wanted to be a priest. Uh, he had two or three priests and as many as eight nuns in his uh, father and mother's family. So it was a, an extremely religious family. He, he wanted to be a priest. At the age of 12, he therefore entered a Capuchin uh, secondary school, but he was unable to do that in France because Capuchins, after the laws of separation, uh, members of the Capuchin order and other religious <coughs> orders in France were no longer permitted to teach. And very often, for the most part, in fact, they were no longer permitted to exist at all. So they went into exile from France. Pierre, uh, not yet Pierre-Marie Benoit, but the, the boy who would become Pierre-Marie Benoit witnessed the exile of um, friars and priests of whom he was very fond. He witnessed the closing of schools, and when he chose to be a priest, he went to Holland to pursue his secondary schooling in a Capuchin school in Holland. From that school, where he did extremely well, he was unquestionably a brilliant uh, young man and a, and a brilliant older man, he uh, went to, uh, he finished his secondary studies and then went to uh, I'm sorry, he did not go to Holland at first, he went to Belgium. Uh, and then for his uh, seminary studies to begin this study as a, as a priest, he went to Holland. In 1913, he was, uh, he became in fact a Capuchin friar, but not yet ordained. So we can now call him Frere uh, Marie Benoit. Uh, but in 1914, the war broke out. At, at that point, he returned to France, uh, entered the, the French army as an infantry private, and fought in the trenches for the entire duration of the war. He even remained for a year after the war for service in 1919 before he was demobilized. And his war record, letters of his war uh, experiences exist. Uh, they're very vivid, and he was at Verdun you can only imagine the kind of war experience he had. After the war, he returned to Holland uh, to his seminary studies, but he was very quickly chosen because of his excellence as a student to go to Rome, where he entered uh, an international Capuchin college uh, and also enrolled at the Gregorian University in Rome uh, to pursue both his graduate studies in philosophy and theology, and, his, and to finish his training as a Capuchin priest. Again, he did extremely well. He was ordained in 1923, and as soon as he finished his doctorate, he was appointed to teach at the Collège, the Collège International in Rome, where he had just a few months before been a student. Now, uh, from that appointment uh, as a professor at the uh, Collège International des Capucins, he um, spent the next, uh, well, the, the next intervening period until the war broke out in 1939 as a professor teaching theology and philosophy to uh, Capuchin students at the Collège and also many, and if not most, mm -hmm. of whom were already priests. <coughs> he enjoyed very much the, the contemplative, the speculative life, the quiet life. Um, but this was a man of two, uh, of two facets, really. There was something in him that also uh, relished the active life, as, as we will see. Uh, was he at any point in any of this time interested in, in Jews? It's very hard to find uh, evidence, but there is a tantalizing um, reference that he made later to the fact that he joined in 1926 an organization called Amici di Israel, which was for the most part an Italian organization. Um, 
there were some 3,000 priests, bishops, cardinals uh, who were affiliated with the organization. Uh, I'm not sure whether there were non-Italian uh, uh, clerics in the organization at this early day, you think so? I'm not sure. I do know that the organization was banned by Pius XI two years after its formation in 1928. The purpose of the organization had been to foster and enhance and improve Catholic-Jewish relations, and the organization foundered in 1928 when it appealed to Pius XI and the Roman Curia for a change in the liturgy of the Good Friday uh, Mass in which there was the famous, the infamous reference to the conversion of the perfidious Jews. The organization petitioned for a change in the liturgy, in the liturgy and uh, recent scholarship and access to the uh, archives in Rome has uh, revealed that this was a quite a divisive uh, petition and that the fact that Pius XI uh, refused the petition and dissolved the organization is a little bit more complex because we are now coming to understand that there were a number of prelates in Rome who were on the other side, who were in as early as 1928 quite anxious to change this liturgy. It was a divisive and fascinating issue. But off the point, um, he was therefore, for, for one reason or another, interested in Jewish Catholic relations and um, admi admiring of the Jewish people. We don't really know why, whether it was because he met Jews in the, uh, during the war, during the First World War, uh, in, the, in the trenches, uh, whether it was because of his Hebrew studies at the Gregorian University, where he did extremely well uh, in Hebrew. His uh, friends in Israel later reported that his uh, Hebrew was really bookish, but not too bad. Um, <laughs> Whether he was aware of some of the growing um, movement in France in particular, and in particular among the Jesuits, toward better Jewish relations. And again, this very complex issue because certainly uh, Catholics, uh, Catholic priests and, and uh, scholars were divided, and that's a whole other story. But for whatever reason, he seems to have been interested in, in Jews and Jewish relations by 1939. In 1939, he was uh, in Rome, still teaching, and he was sent back to uh, France, and he was actually mobilized and um, served as an interpreter for a few short months in September and October of 1939. But when it looked as if um, the war was going to <coughs> be a stalemate, and uh, that I Italy was not going to enter, he was allowed to go back to Rome, uh, from which he was ejected quite rapidly in May of 1940, when it became apparent that Italy, after all, was going to uh, enter, the, enter the war on the, on the side of the Germans. He went, at that point, to Marseille. And at Marseille, almost immediately, so now we are in, in June of 1940, he began to become involved in Jewish issues. He seems first of all to have, he seems to have begun by giving lectures uh, throughout Marseille to Catholic groups about the need to have compassion for those who were in need. He was particularly interested in refugees and political, uh, those, those who were in danger for, of political, um, for political reasons. Uh, but he spoke a, a great deal about um, the need for compassion for Jewish refugees who were pouring into southern France, of course, and into Marseille. He spoke often at the convent of the Sisters of, the, of uh, Notre Dame de Zion, a, a famous uh, convent and a famous religious order uh, which ministers to Jews and in, in many different ways uh, for greater or less great uh, objectives of conversion, but that again is a long and complicated uh, topic. He, uh, but he did speak publicly uh, for the need for compassion for the Jews. He, because of that, some Jews began to come to his I say convent sometimes because the French say convent, to his monastery. Um, 
Jews would knock on his door and say, I have a problem. Now, most of those in need in these early years were uh, refugees who had been in internment camps or uh, had been interned, long-term resident uh, uh, immigrants in, uh, in France, which who were Jewish, or recent refugees from France, northern France, from Belgium and from Holland, who had, or from Germany, who had escaped just ahead of the Germans in May of 1940. These were the people who were in need, refugees, uh, Jewish and non, but most often for Marie Benoit, Jewish, and they needed fall. They had escaped from the camps where they were legal, uh, but interned, and they were now trying to live illegal, illegally. They were not trying to escape deportation at this early period, 1940, 1941, mm -hmm. but they were trying to live illegally and get out of France if possible. He helped them, um, and it's hard to pin down numbers. It was not a large group, but he helped uh, supply false papers and he find hiding places. He began to be drawn in to this rescue operation. And when I asked him why, um, at one point, he said, I, um, I did it because I was a refugee myself and I had no cutout role. Um, and so I chose my own. Uh, I want Joseph Bass. Things became much more intense in August of 1942 when the uh, deportation, when, when, when Vichy France began to expel uh, foreign Jews from southern France in extremely large numbers. At this point, a man named Joseph Bass comes into the picture. Joseph Bass was a Jewish Russian, well, he was a Russian Jew born in Grodno, educated in St. Petersburg, a brilliant man who came to Paris and continued graduate education to the extent that he became both a lawyer and an engineer. He, in Paris, he had a very successful business, which he was forced to leave and fly, uh, flee to the southern uh, zone when the Germans arrived. But even in the 1920s and early 30s, he had committed himself to helping refugees. This uh, help to refugees escalated when refugees in southern France truly needed help. And in August of 1942, he threw himself heart and soul into these, this assistance, which was by this time totally uh, clandestine. He uh, has an amusing quote uh, where, where I won't have time to read about how he recruited Père Marie Benoit, essentially saying to him, you're making public speeches, you're talking, you're, uh, you're, you're, can you, will you put your actions uh, where your mouth is? And Pierre Marie Benoit agreed completely. An extremely close uh, relationship ensued. The two men became fast friends. Some of their letters after the, during and after the war still exist. They admired each other. I think Père Pere Marie Benoit liked Joseph Bass, especially for this exuberance that he had, this kind of daring do, this extreme individualism. Joseph Bass had a particular philosophy of rescue, which differed from other Jewish rescuers, uh, which was that Jews should not be allowed to stay together. They should not be put into children's homes or uh, welcoming centers, uh, much less camps. They should disperse with false documents uh, and, and take on totally false identities if they were going to survive. He was kind of an in-your-face, non-organization man. Of course, this kind of rescue was more limited in, in possibilities and numbers, much more difficult to do. Uh, and many uh, Jewish rescue, uh, refugees were terrified to go into the kind of lonely um, isolation that was required. But Joseph Bass did it to a large extent. He recruited at first for his organization called the Service André. He recruited Jews. And then slowly as the need grew, he recruited Père Marie Benoit and other priests and Protestant pastors in the area. The final organization, the Service en Bay, was more effective because of this cooperative venture. Uh, they, each of the two men and their assistants could draw on resources that the other could not. Uh, 
that Joseph Bass knew the clients. He knew who he knew who really needed help. And he also had access to uh, Maurice Plenaire and the uh, Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which provided a good deal of the financing. Pierre-Marie Benoit knew a network already of priests who would be helpful. He was able to recommend villages in southern France where he knew a priest who would take refugees, place refugees, and he knew local parishioners who would be sympathetic. So together, the two men performed the um, the great work of the Service André, with, of course, uh, the help of many others. Joseph Bass was always the, the leader of the Service André. Pierre-Marie Benoit was just one of several assistants uh, and did not was not a leader at this point. But the skills he learned uh, in southern France with Joseph Bass, he then took with him to Rome, where he truly was the leader of an organization, but again working with a Jewish organization called Delasem, with um, charismatic, dynamic Jewish characters who became his great friends for life. Uh, so he replicated what he had learned in France in Rome, and there at that point, uh, always writing to Joseph Bass as, well, not always, but when he could, saying, I'm continuing our work, and there he was able to save several thousand. I'm sorry I have to cut so much, but thank you very much. Could have, 
some instances. The only case that, that is known is in Belgium. There's one transport that the Jewish resistance stopped the train, opened the doors, and told the Jews to run. Uh, but that's the only case. Not in Poland, not in France, nowhere. Because the idea was to fight the Germans, blow up German munition trains, uh, and so forth. So to people like uh, uh, like like Musa, uh, like uh, Joseph Bass, and I, I want to mention because Saliège was mentioned uh, yesterday. Georges Gabriel went to see Saliège, and Saliège gave him a carte blanche and he gave him letters of introduction to various Catholic institutions. <coughs> Georges Gabriel could go with with the letters of Saliège, and they opened their doors uh, to uh, save Jews. So. Uh, how can you dismiss the, the action of a person like this and, uh, and not mention him at all? I'm not saying they should be given the right to strike. The right to strike is for Gentiles, okay. But I'm sure we can devise another honorific for Jews, okay, who actually went above and beyond. Uh, I just want to make another point. The uh, Hashem, a Gentile who says one Jew is a righteous among the nations, he gets a medal, he gets a tree, he gets everything. <laughs> Which is fair. I was involved in that for 24 years. I was involved in that. Okay. But I'm, so my contention is not to honor the Jew, say that I'm a Jew, but people like Walter Suskin, who was in Amsterdam, and he uh, saved the without the Jew through the help of Dutch persons. All these Dutch persons have treated the upper shell. And Walter Suskin did not mention. So that's, I think it's a crime. And that has to be corrected. And hopefully it will be corrected. I, was, I would just add very quickly that we should remember that um, this was not, uh, France and Italy were not Poland. Uh, the intensity of the uh, reprisals was not so great. Um, if you were caught, uh, as if you were a rescuer and you were caught, if you were a non-Jew, yes, of course, some died. But many were not, many did not, many were imprisoned or punished or reprieved if their bishop uh, intervened, if they were the people of the church. Uh, their chances of survival were at least, uh, could at least be defined as a possibility. Whereas if you were Jewish and you were a rescuer and you were caught, you had no chance whatsoever to survive. You were, you were deported. If I may add that the risk uh, issue is not really um, the core issue here. I guess, in a way, uh, the Israeli case and the French case are the same because in, in if the Jewish rescuers has not, have not been uh, recognized in Israel because of the importance of the distinction between Jews and non-Jews as a, a distinction at the core of the history of the country. And in France, it's because of the... Um, la laicity and the, the fact that this, this distinction between Jews and non-Jews must not really be uh, addressed in the public sphere. And if you look at the Belgian case, I think it can help us to, to think about this question of the recognition of the Jewish rescue because here, um, beginning in 1946, the resistance civil, the civil resistance, uh, received an official and state recognition uh, for Jews and non-Jews, and uh, among the, the acts of civil resistance were the ones uh, helping Jews, and you, you, you were entitled to a special uh, medal and uh, official recognition for helping Jews, uh, whether you were Jews or not. And this has to be linked with the way the, the Belgian society and the Belgian states deals with this kind of distinction between uh, the religious identity within the public. There's a rescuer here who would just like to make a comment about this question, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, I just want to bring up one comment. Okay. If you could stand up and, and speak up a little bit so everyone can hear you, that would be great. Her name is, her name is Renee Wiener, and she was a rescuer with the MJS, Mouvement de Jeunesse en uh, who worked in Nice and then in ANSI, in Nice in, the, in September 43, which many of you are very familiar with, and then in ANSI in 1944. I just want to make, but I consider an important point. If you were a Frenchman and not Jewish, and you kept your mouth shut and you said quietly, you could go through the war without being bothered and, uh, and the least uh, inconvenience. A Jew risked his life just by being, I mean, uh, just uh, walking out or, or 
or he was staying in, uh, he was we were doomed anyway. So you know, it was just a question of what punishment you could get to be uh, arrested as a Jew or as a resistant. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he had a choice between Auschwitz and the wasn't that easy, but uh, I, I just want to say that there is a reason to consider uh, non-Jewish rescuers with more respect somehow or awe, because they did risk more than they did. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they could have just gone through the war without food, and we could not. That's all I can say. Uh, and uh, you're absolutely, that's why at Yad Vashem we honor non Jewish rescuers. We, we do that, but not at the price of completely overlooking uh, people uh, of the Jewish faith who uh, did above and beyond, above and beyond, ongoing. Uh, there is here in New York a lady, she's now uh, held at the uh, Flatka Meet, maybe you've heard of her. And she in Poland, she went from place to place to look for hiding places for Jews, but can meet. Um, she risked herself uh, so many times. She, you see, when you say Jews were at risk, the fine, the, my counter argument is if you are at risk, if you are at risk, if you know that people are after you, what do you try to do? You try to avoid being caught, right? You don't go and be double and double and triple and make the risk more obvious. The risk is well, well, don't you try to save yourself? Funny. You try to save yourself. And not to expose yourself even more and more and more. <coughs> Ongoing. You know, there are people in France, like uh, Andre Salomon, they, they traveled on trains, they went on trains back and forth. They could have been arrested uh, dozens of times. So if you are at risk, then you try to, uh, to take uh, measures to, uh, uh, to protect yourself. And not to double do it, but like a little bit ridiculous to to add to your risk more and more. And if you do that, and you do that for idealistic and for ideological and for humanitarian reasons, don't you think that people like that should be acknowledged and recognized in one way or another? Acknowledged, yes, but uh, I don't. You know, I think not as righteous as Gentiles, sure, but in a different way. <laughs> I think Sarah has something to add to this. Maybe you could speak a little bit about the Abbey Latin case. And the way Yad Vashem dealt with it, because uh, mm -hmm. from a Nazi point of view, Abed was uh, uh, also could also have been persecuted and arrested and deported. And nevertheless, the commission uh, decided to. So I maybe it will be useful for the debate. Uh, Abed Glasberg, Alexander Glasberg, was born Jewish <laughs> in Zhitomir in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And he was converted by his parents into the Russian Orthodox uh, faith. And then uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution, he, uh, he fled with his brother to Germany, and from Germany to France. And in France, he decided to enter the priesthood, uh, and he studied for the priesthood. And then he had to be baptized again because uh, to become a priest, the Catholic faith, they didn't recognize his baptism in the, in the Republic. Right. He became a priest. Uh, and then during the war, he created his own network, his Catholic network, uh, which uh, to save many Jews. And he succeeded in that. Uh, Abi Glasberg, after the war, also helped in many, in many ways uh, the growing Jewish state. Uh, he also helped uh, to get Jews out of Iraq, uh, traveled to Iran, and, and got in touch with the Assyrian church. The interesting thing about Abi Glasberg, who died in 1981, was that after the war, when uh, he was asked whether uh, they could put his name for nomination to the righteous Gentiles. And his answer was, you're forcing me to be a Gentile? I'm a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare bring it up again. <laughs> and so what happened? He died. And after he died, many of the people that uh, had worked with him, Jewish people, uh, petitioned to Yad Vashem uh, to have him uh, recognized. And it was a big debate at the commission. Uh, I, I asked the opinion of Rabbi Dow, the Israeli chief rabbi. And Rabbi Dow said, uh, if a person assists he's Jewish, he can't afford him to be a Gentile. Therefore, he cannot be on the list. But Yad Vashem decided otherwise that he, as a Catholic priest, is a Gentile. And as a Gentile, he's on the list of the righteous. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think he has a lot of
Yeah, so many important points were made this morning. I hate to harp again on, on the one that we've been discussing, but on this issue of Jewish rescuers, uh, isn't another important factor to consider that one reason it has been ta taken so long to attach importance to Jewish rescue, that it raises the question of what occurred in the Jewish world, particularly outside of Nazi-occupied Europe, what occurred in Israel, what occurred in the United States, and that once you start raising those questions, you raise all sorts of cans of worms that we have not been yet willing to let in. And one additional remark in that regard is that we shouldn't view what happened in Vichy, France as removed from what was happening in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That all this is interrelated. And just as Yad Vashem has found it difficult to figure out what to do with Jewish rescuers, it is also the, the Yad Vashem Museum still does not recognize uh, efforts that occurred outside of it, the world, including in the United States, to deal with the massacre of the Jews of Europe, a total refusal to integrate Peter Berkson, who led the most determined effort in America to focus attention on this issue. What do you think? Yes, well, uh, and, and everything, even the, on the question of the uh, non-Jewish rescuers, uh, there are many debatable points. Uh, I just want to, uh, I, I want to mention the case of Oscar Schindler. But before that, uh, one of the arguments against uh, honoring Jewish rescuers is uh, that, for instance, what do you do with the story of Rudolf Kastner? It's like a minefield. Mm -hmm. So we honor him, he's saved, but he, does he collaborate and so on. And therefore, so goes the position of Yad Vashem, since we don't want to step on, on a minefield like Rudolf Kastner, so we leave the whole program out. Uh, what uh, many people don't know, but I've done some research, and I found out that when the name of Oskar Schindler came up in 1963 for recognition, it almost caused the commission to explode. Uh, because uh, there were some people who claimed that Oskar Schindler had forced himself on them and stole their property. And these people petitioned that he not be allowed to, to have a tree at Yad Vashem. And when the case came up before discussion, and at the commission, and uh, there are archives from that, if you read Hebrew. Uh, and it came to a vote, and the president, the chairman of the commission, uh, Moshe Landau, uh, he was the person who was uh, uh, who tried Adolf Eichmann, and then he was the first chairman of the Commission of the Righteous. He said that if the commission votes to honor Oscar Schindler as a righteous, he would have to resign. <coughs> You would not have a German who stole Jewish property, a member of the Nazi party, in spite of the fact that he saved over a thousand Jews, not have that man on the list. And so the commission voted not to recognize Oscar Schindler in 1963, although he had already planted the tree, because the trees came first. It, it's, I don't, it's a complicated tree. And he was only, <laughs> he was only recognized post-mortem after his wife, Emily, who was in Argentina, when she was honored, they decided officially to honor Oscar Schindler. So I'm saying there are many issues in honoring non-Jews. Uh, the question of honoring uh, <coughs> Metropolitan Sheptitsky in Lvov, and uh, the question uh, of uh, honoring uh, Gerlier. Uh, there are many points, uh, debatable points, and one can debate. Uh, whether Gerlier should be on the uh, on the list of the righteous or not. Gerlier was the head of the Catholic Church in, in Lyon, and he was Pope in this. Uh, and, but that's not an excuse for not doing anything. I think, uh, as Pierre pointed out, we should also have, in that program for Jewish rescue, we should also have persons like Peter Bergson, otherwise known as Peter <coughs> Cook, uh, and Martello in Switzerland, and Recha Sternbuch, we should have some kind of program, maybe without a medal. <laughs> they don't need a medal because they're, they're no longer with us. So. <laughs> but we should have some kind of program that they are included within the fabric of, of Holocaust institutions <laughs> and not be swept aside simply because there's a problem here and there because of Jewish infighting or the question whether they should be acknowledged or not. That is something for historians to uh, to debate and, and, and fresh out. Uh, Harriet, you have a question? I have a question. Um, Sarah, I, I think it's so innovative the 
when you're looking at public space in France and the use of, of language for political reasons. And I would, would like to ask you to speak about something that I read in one of your articles, and that is about a commemoration recently that was supposed to take place in a French city for Injuste, and that the local, um, I believe, Communist Party opposed it. So I was wondering if you could just um, you know, talk about that example of the use of, of public space. Okay, is this uh, a peculiar example? Is this, no, the, yeah. is this a peculiar example? Is linked to the fact that each ceremony uh, can be interpreted in uh, different ways. Uh, this is the case you are referring to was uh, in Poitiers, and uh, the ceremony <coughs> couldn't take place because of some pro-Palestinian uh, groups uh, linked to the local Communist Party, but not the National Communist Party who was involved in this, uh, uh, <coughs> asked uh, the, the municipality not to, to host the ceremony <coughs> because they said it was a title uh, uh, given by the State of Israel. So the ceremony <coughs> didn't take place at the end. But, um, and it happens sometimes, not very often, but it happens. And uh, I think it, it already happened even at the first one of the first ceremony at, of the Chambon, where um, the different participants, in the archives I read, the different participants were having uh, some uh, very different, uh, uh, speaking of very different scene and interpreting the ceremony very differently. I think it was the pastor who, uh, the pastor who, or one of the local from the Chambon, when uh, in uh, 1979, I think, when the first uh, plaque was uh, uh, put at the Chambon, um, said, okay, we are very grateful to you who were there during the war to thank us for uh, what we, we did for you, but uh, you, we, we um, want to, to, um, to, to remember you of uh, the way some uh, <coughs> Palestinian children are dying nowadays, and what are you doing about it? You uh, who were there during the war. So it's not, it's, uh, it's a no thing reappearing from time to time. Uh, can I return to the question of risk for a moment? Um, uh, Susan, you mentioned earlier that uh, not um, in France and Italy is different from Poland and elsewhere. And there are certainly quite a few. Uh, rescuers uh, in these countries who uh, perhaps didn't meet the strict uh, definition of risking their life, um, yet have received uh, <coughs> righteous among the nations, designation, um, even perhaps Barry and Fry, um, uh, who certainly uh, did wonderful things. One could argue that he risked his life. Um, do we see a de facto expansion in recent years of the Yad Vashem definition and the application of this, um, uh, and a sort of a bit of a, uh, I don't want to say dilution, but an expansion of uh, acceptable of behavior that would merit righteous. Yes, well, there, there, there was a debate inside the commission when the commission was headed by Moshe Beisky. Moshe Beisky was one of the Shindler survivors, Shindler Newton, and later on he uh, be, became a judge and he was on uh, uh, the judge on the Israel Supreme Court. And he was the head of the commission for close to 20 years. I worked very closely with him. And in the, in the committee, whenever a case came up, and someone said, well, in France, especially the members uh, in the commission who were of Polish origin, they said in, in Poland, when they called a Paul who sheltered the Jew, they took him out and shot him. They killed him. They might have killed his family. And there were posters warning the population of the death penalty in Poland, which is true. In France, people were not killed. So maybe we should not honor uh, French rescuers. Uh, you know. The response of uh, Basky was that when we say risk, to, it means risk, any type of risk, even imprisonment, and a risk where you don't know the outcome. There were cases in France, like Fed Jacques, who were sent to a concentration camp, or well, Daniel talked to me, uh, and there were some others who were sent to concentration camps and did not return. So the fact that there was the potential 
that if you shelter a Jew or help a Jew, you may wind up, you may, like Adelaide Oval, she did not, she just protested the fact when she saw the Jews in prison and, uh, and she was sent to Auschwitz, Adelaide. So the very fact that there was a potential of risks, that meets the requirement. And therefore, many French people who helped Jews were added to the list of the writers. So he uh, widened the explanation uh, of uh, the risk factor. As he said in one of the sessions, the risk factor doesn't mean that a person saw himself standing uh, with the hand was not uh, around his neck. It means that he was disobeying the regulations as far as assistance to Jews, and he was getting himself uh, into trouble in case of apprehension, and no one knows where this, this may end. And he was qualified. And this has been accepted to Bayat Hashem, and therefore many French people who helped Jews uh, were added to the list of the righteous. Okay, Harriet has a question, and then this gentleman was waiting for a long time, and then someone else came there. So Harriet first. Uh, yes, uh, Susan, your, your, your paper raises a really interesting question about uh, what might have prepared Marie Benoit to become the person who became after 1939. Uh, and it, that sort of suggests a larger question about uh, the extent to which uh, we know about uh, non-Jewish rescuers' experiences in the, in the 1930s or even before that may have prepared them. Uh, there was, for people paying attention in class in the 1930s, there were plenty of things to think about in terms of anti-Semitism and the treatment of refugees and issues of citizenship and naturalization and so on. So do you, do you, can you say more either about him or about the larger question of, of the, the life of rescuers before the rescue? Susan, can you repeat the question a little bit louder with the microphone so everyone in the back can hear? The question was, uh, could I say more about the preparation uh, of, by, of Père Marie Benoit for the uh, issues that he was going to face uh, in 1939 and 1940 and afterward? Um, or, even better, could I say something about the preparation or the ambiance uh, or the environment, upbringing, the, uh, education of rescuers in general. Um, now, if the question is only for France, that's one thing. Um, Nahama Tech, of course, in her wonderful book, uh, When Light Pierced the Darkness, did a very systematic study of rescuers in Poland in which she found that some of them were anti-Semites. Um, there was no common denominator in terms of religion, religious observance, uh, in terms of class, uh, profession, no real common denominator. Um, in France, the issue is probably different, but I don't know, and more I might answer better, the, whether there was a commonal, commonality. I, I have searched very hard for Père Marie Benoit to try to determine what influences uh, there were, and I mentioned some of them, uh, but I really don't know why he joined uh, Amici d'Israël in 1926. Uh, you can study, at least for religious, for Catholics, and I think because in France, well, Poland too, for that matter, but uh, many were religious, uh, you can try to decipher the religious message that they were getting from the church in terms of Jews. And the only thing really that you could come up with is that there were mixed messages and people seemed to pick the message that they wanted to hear. Uh, so that there were those who read uh, Osservatore Romano and Civita Cattolica in France and in, um, and in Italy who would have read the most devastatingly unpleasant anti-Semitism. <coughs> there are others who listen to what Pope Pius XI might have said and did say and took from those speeches which were often also printed in a Observatorio Romano, the same, um, the same journal that was publishing articles about, well, what's happening in Romania or Hungary in terms of separation from schools and businesses. They didn't say it was a good thing, but they would say, uh, essentially they were saying it was a good thing. Mm. So there were mixed messages, and how individuals sorted out these messages uh, is, is very hard. To, to know. And then, of course, Mordecai, I'm thinking more for those who were observant Catholics and what, how they read 
the messages we heard last night in the movie about, um, was it John Marie Sutu who said, uh, Pius XI said spiritually, we are all Semites. Well, that was uh, in, that was, I gathered, published in Témoignage Chrétien in 1941, so people knew about it. But who heard, who, how do you really hear the message? And how do you then sort that out from the fact that Pius XI said nothing about the Jews, really, over, except for that one speech. It was really the only time he mentioned uh, Jews and anti-Semitism. He did make speeches condemning racism, which were brief and veiled. It's a very complex, the distinction between racism and anti-Semitism is very complex. Attitudes of the church toward Jews who were observant Jews differed from attitudes of the, of the church toward those who were being persecuted because of some kind of concept of race, who might have been good Jewish Catholics, but were still being persecuted for reasons of race. So these, these mixed messages are very hard to sort out. And that's only for rescuers who were Catholic. Could you speak more on Well, uh, about common denominators, I, I, am, I still don't have, I'm still struggling with that. But I want to make the following observation. Most of these people that we honor as rescuers, uh, they were in a situation where they were challenged. In other words, there was, uh, first of all, a close uh, contact. There was an eye for eye contact. Uh, they were there on the scene. But they were not sitting uh, back someplace in Houston, Texas, and they were in an account of, about what's happening in China. And they said, I'm going to help these people. They happened to be on the spot. Uh, in many cases, there was a knock on the door, and a, and a Jewish colleague came and he said, "Can I stay overnight?" and so on. And there, there was a direct eye-to-eye -eye contact, and uh, or, or if there was not an eye-to-eye -eye contact, they were there on the scene, and they saw that these Jews were being persecuted for no reason, or whether you you have stereotypes of things about Jews, whether you you blame the Jews for the death of Jesus or not. But certainly, these people have the right to live. Uh, if these people don't have a right to live, maybe the next day I'm not going to have a right to live. Who knows where this will go? And, and so you are there on the scene, and sometimes you see the victim right standing in front of you. I mean, uh, uh, and what happens there, then I don't know. We, we talked yesterday about Baron Fry. Baron Fry uh, left uh, New York and came to France with a list of 200 names. And when he came to France, uh, many on this list, he couldn't find them because uh, they were hiding, or they didn't want to show themselves. But then others came and uh, at, at his office, uh, at his hotel room, and suddenly there were hundreds and hundreds. And there were these people that needed to, to, to get out. And, and there was this proximity, this eye-to-eye -eye contact. So he decided uh, to throw the law to the winds and, and to, to use every unorthodox method. So the common denominator, sure there's a background. There's this incident of Aaron Fry, 1935, where you saw him go in. But uh, it's very hard to understand what happens to a person uh, when there is that, that very proximity in eye to eye contact, okay? When you walk out on the street and you see a homeless person sitting there uh, and you pass them by uh, and you don't drop a quarter of a dollar, uh, what goes in your mind is that person, he's not gonna, nobody's gonna kill him, so maybe tomorrow when I see him, uh, I'll help him. But uh, during the Nazi period, when the Jews uh, is in front of you and they ask for your help, and if you turn them down, that may be the end of it. That it may be at the end of the line. And so to say no, uh, what happens at, at that moment when saying no could mean that you are maybe dooming that person and you are asked to play God? That's very difficult. There's no precedent of that before. Uh, and so it's, it's very hard for me to find a common denominator. Sure, there were exceptional people uh, who, because of their background, uh, they were more uh, uh, ready to come out and help. But of the thousands of, of righteous among the nations, on Yad Vashem to this, these are people from all walks of life who never saw themselves as altruistic inclined above the regular person. And we would, would never think, if you had asked him, would you be ready to risk your life and life of your family, like in Poland, by sheltering a Jew? And they probably would have no, if, if, if it means I would lose my life or even my place. But when suddenly there's a knock on the door and this person stands in front of you, and you know what's happening because you're there. You're there in Poland.
moment, do you know what's happening? And to say no, uh, to many of these people, uh, something happened which they cannot explain later on. <laughs> they say uh, it was a natural thing, I didn't say no, I don't know why. But they find very hard to articulate their, an intelligible explanation. Oh. None of the righteous, when they were asked why you help Jews, it's not because I read Kant and I read Hegel and I read <laughs> and I came to the decision based on these philosophies that I have to have. Some of them said I did it because I'm a Christian, I believe in the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay. Some of them just they were looking for an answer. So it's very difficult and I don't have it. But the beautiful thing about this type of help is that these people help without knowing why. <laughs> that's the mystery, and that's the beautiful thing about this aspect. Unfortunately, there were not too many, but I always ask myself that those people that we honor as righteous, these are the people who were challenged, who were asked. And the others uh, who were not asked, maybe if they had been challenged and asked, maybe we would have had some more, but they were never approached. Okay, we have time. We have time for two more. Oh, Susan wants well, to ask I, I just, we have I just more wanted questions. To, I just wanted to add to one very, very brief uh, uh, story, which was told. I heard Nahama Tech, who had studied rescuers and was herself rescued in Warsaw as a child with her family. So she lived through the worst of it. And I remember her saying to a group at one point, she said, You know, I was rescued. I now live in the United States and I have children. Uh, she was speaking the whole situation, but she said, I don't know what I would have done if someone had knocked on my door and asked for help. I think it puts another perspective on, on, on this. Okay, we're, I'm sorry, but we're just going to take two more questions that I'm going to ask you to keep brief. This gentleman's been waiting for a long time, and then uh, in the back. Yes. I'm sorry, but this gentleman's been waiting for a very long time, so I'm going to let him, let him speak first. If you don't um, I do have, uh, actually, I, I have interviewed a number of rescuers in France uh, in association with, with Eva Holderman and her work. And I do commend everyone to read Eva's book because I believe she does have a very good perspective on what does separate the altruists, the people who, who were able to uh, and, and those not. Uh, one of the common themes uh, that you uh, just heard was that many of these people had <coughs> had an experience in their youth or in the background that separated themselves from the group. And I think that is the essential thing that, that happens here. These people have been able to separate from the group. The people in Chambon, for example, were mainly Protestants who had been terribly discriminated uh, previously. A number of the people had had illnesses in their childhood which, you know, gave them, you know, put them outside the group allowed them. So <clears throat> I think that that uh, is, uh, is an important perspective. Okay. Well, I just wanted to clarify a few things. I'm not a Holocaust scholar, I'm a film scholar. That's my work is in film. And I think perhaps, you know, Alain Berger, he's my friend, and he's a colleague at the Malger. He took yeah. his little cell phone and filmed the Varda um, installation so that I could see that's how I started to work on it. But what I wanted to say was that what we need to understand is that the commemorations are in our contempt. We have to look at the context in which these comm commemorations come. And while it's important to debate risk, who risk, and what people did at that time, I think the contemporary reception, the effort to make Jewish issues everybody's issues is really important. And this is what I wanted to say about the Varda thing. I just, just to defend it a little bit. Oh, I was going to say, okay. yes. It was, no, no. She yes. in the whole notion of the state. I gave this paper at a colloquium on Anya's Vata, and I decided to talk about her work on this installation that had to do with the Jews and Jewish history. And she now says it les just in it, and which she hadn't thought about when she put it together, but she did her work on this installation at CBJC and at the whole exposition of the Mide Memorial on the Jews. So the idea, what I tried to do with my interpretation. We have to try to, I'm sorry, we have to try to keep this. Okay. To, to, to a question. The onset, the, the stuff, and I, I go back to women and children. You know, Hotel Chamber News is about uh, Klaus Barbie, but it's really about the children of his youth. People forget that. The dedication is to Madame Bontou, a good neighbor. These are 
non-recognized people who did things like pull a child from the stairs as the, her parents were being arrested. And I think that we could just, the, the whole point is to start talking about how we receive things. Père Jacques <coughs> is the, the father in Ouvoir les Enfants. We could talk about that and how the, 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 the culture receives those. Thank you very much. This is a, a, obviously a very, very uh, lively discussion that, that raise many more questions than we can ask, answer the little ask. Um, but we're going to take a break for lunch and we'll start again promptly at 1 o'clock. If anyone has questions that they want to continue.